All right, today we're going to execute the derivation of the Riemann curvature tensor using the round trip method, which I put in quotes because it's my word. I think the real way you'll see it in textbooks is it's called the parallel transport around a closed curve method. And uh, this is the most common method shown, and it's usually the first method people learn. So students learning the, the method I talked about isn't really even a method because all I did was define the Riemann curvature tensor in the last lecture. I just sort of presented this thing by, by fiat, right? Said this is what it is. So now, using this round trip method, we're kind of going to understand ultimately, we're going to ultimately, we're going to end up with the same um, uh, coordinate based uh, answer that we were able to derive by converting this from, uh, from the from coordinate free notation to a coordinate basis. So we're going to start with that, and then we're going to link the two up so we can see why this is related to that. And uh, hopefully coming from this angle, we can tie it all together, and it will be inspiring. The Riemann curvature tensor itself, by the way, is sort of like the, the place in general relativity where the wheels come off for a lot of people. It's it's the first place this word curvature comes up, and that's exactly what inspires people to study the subject is, really, space-time is curved? And when they say space-time is curved, they usually don't even have that insight. They usually say space is curved, right? And understanding that space is curved, well, that's true, but the reality is, is that the, the, the theory talks about space-time being curved. And the Riemann curvature tensor is the embodiment of that curvature. So this clearly is something that has to be understood in great detail. The problem is, is it doesn't help you visualize four dimensions any better, right? Understanding this is just a way of mathematically capturing what we mean by curvature. In fact, in some sense, this round trip method even defines a notion of what curvature is. But it's still a mathematical abstraction. It, it doesn't really help with your visualization of the world, necessarily. And I think that disappoints a lot of people. They get all the way to this point, they run through the math that we're about to run through, and they don't feel like they can close their eyes and see space and time bending any better than they could before. Well, so be it. Right? The, the, the purpose is, the point is that the human mind is simply not equipped to have direct intuition on what this curvature is for anything other than surfaces embedded in three-dimensional space. And at that level, we all have the intuition to understand it. We all understand that the surface of a sphere, right, the surface of a sphere embodies a geometry that is different from a geometry of a flat plane, right? That's not a problem. But taking that intuition and projecting it into four-dimensional space where the metric is actually minus one, 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 right? The metric's not even Euclidean. The metric's this Minkowski metric, this Lorentzian metric. And it doesn't help, right? Even though all of this, this connection right here is fully, uh, uh, is fully controlled by the Riemann curvature tensor, in actuality, you've already passed the wickets of making this connection in principle because it's really, when I say it's fully controlled by the Riemann curvature tensor, I'm actually not doing justice to the connection, right? This is the guy that actually controls what curvature is, and this guy controls what curvature is through, as I said, the metric. So the metric is the thing that, if you understand the metric in principle, if this really good intuition were possible, you'd already be doing it but because you understand the metric. But it, the metric is too, maybe the metric's too deep, right? Maybe the metric is too subtle, and it, the, the, the brain can't just go from the metric to the curved structure of four-dimensional space. So then we think, okay, well, maybe the connection is the answer. And that's a step because the connection tells us about parallel transport, which we can understand intuitively. I mean, I drew, drew a lot of pictures about parallel transport in the earlier lecture. So then... But even that is not quite enough, although, you know, you can kind of understand curves in space-time and how they might be geodesic curves if, uh, if they follow the various the geodesic equation, right? You know, you can kind of get there. But even here, you know, we're still suppressing one spatial dimension in order to make this work, right? With time going this way and sort of an XY plane space and Z has been suppressed. 
So even there, we're suppressing dimension. So, well, all right, so this doesn't necessarily fill us with intuitive insight about the curvature of space-time. Well, now we have one more shot. Maybe this guy will. Maybe the thing that's actually called the curvature tensor, maybe that guy will, in fact, be the trick. Once we understand this, then we'll understand four-dimensional space-time with a Lorentzian metric. Maybe that'll be it. Um, but uh, I think what what happens is you get to that point and you realize, yeah, you know, I'm just as the same place I was when I when all I understood was either the metric or the connection. It's 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 still now a bunch of pure mathematical abstraction. So the journey to getting this understanding, this intuition, is sort of a long and slow one, and it doesn't. I don't think it ever really uh, pops out. It. I, I feel like the best you can do is sort of the, the journey that I described in the, the book uh, available to the patrons. Um, what is a, uh, 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 why does it move is the title of the book. And that's the book that I wrote that really does everything you can possibly do to try to understand visually um, what we mean by uh, curvature of space time. And it's, you know, it, it does, it tries its best, but it's really just, a, uh, a, uh, a trick, right? It's, it's a bit of a bait and switch. I promise to try my best and I try my best, but in the end, I just get the reader way down the road of understanding the geodesic equation in a lot of fine detail, and it's, and, which is good in and of itself. And at some point, at some point, when you get mature in this subject, you stop hunting. You stop hunting for this intuitive understanding of how a four-dimensional space-time with an odd metric is laid out in some visual and natural way. And you become gracefully accepting of the fact that in the end, it's all about the way the human mind captures this through pure mathematics. And so regardless, we are going to, we are going to proceed forward and attack this thing and um, uh, start using this method, which kind of does tell us at least how this thing is intended to capture the curvature of any manifold. And it doesn't even have to just be 4D. This is very general stuff. It's just um, uh, uh, all you need is a connection. All you need is a connection. Okay, so uh, let's begin. So we're going to begin with a quick review, or we, gotta, we have to start with a review, of the notion of parallel transport. So I'm going to begin with a point in our space-time, and that point is labeled by the coordinates x mu. And I cannot help but demystify x mu by writing it down as it literally might look to label this coordinate point, x0, x1, x2, and x3. This is always meant to be a little x, by the way, you know, and it's very clear in textbooks the difference between x that represents a vector and then x that represents a point in space-time. I can't rely on myself to make that difference uh, evident, so I'm going to make our vector actually y. But now we understand what x mu is. It's one particular point in space-time. And often in general relativity work, you'll see x mu, and it's implied that it's actually a curve in space-time, whereby they've suppressed the argument of the parameterization of the curve. That's really not what we're going to do in this case. So x mu literally will be the point, the coordinates of a point p. So I might have even, if I did have an argument, I would have an argument of p, where p is sort of the name of this point in space-time, right? That comes up a lot, too. Um, that shows up in Wheeler a lot. But the point is, I'm just trying to find a way of labeling the coordinates of that point right there. And now that I've gone through all that, I'm just going to go back to labeling it with x mu. Now, there will be a nearby point in space-time, and we'll talk about what nearby means in a moment, but I'll draw that point here. As a matter of fact, why don't I just give it a different color? Why don't I call it green? That point is also going to have coordinates, and the difference between the coordinate values of this point and the coordinate values of this point, I'm going to indicate by uh, delta x mu this little delta function. I don't want to use d because uh, it implies to, it gets very, a little bit confused with the, uh, with our, um, our one forms, right? So we got to be careful about using d. But this represents a difference in coordinates between this point here and this point here. 
And the actual coordinate values at this point right here, right, are going to be, and I will write them in black, x mu, which is the coordinates of this point, plus delta x mu. All right, so with that in mind, we now have the coordinates of two different points in space-time. And they're nearby. They're nearby. So in mathematics and physics, you're not allowed to use descriptions like near, close, big, far, large, and small. You're not allowed to say those things unless you provide context that makes it literally meaningful. You know, when we talk about atoms, you know, when we talk about, for example, um, black holes, ultimately when we get to the Schwarzschild solution in full detail, which we're working towards, you know, near and far can only be measured relative to the one distance in the problem, which is the Schwarzschild radius, right? So we don't have anything of, of that nature in this problem. So when we say delta x mu is small, what I'm basically saying is that it makes total sense to go delta x mu can get arbitrarily small. It, can, it's, it gets all the way to zero. And that doesn't, when you allow this, then it doesn't matter what scale you're dealing with. Because if you can drag this thing to zero, then no matter what problem you're solving, you can find a value where it is physically or mathematically uh, understood as small. I think, in fact, mathematically understood as small would literally mean this. I don't think there's any other way to do it mathematically. Physically, you can get so small that certain things can be ignored or things like that. But anyway, so now we have the coordinates of two different points. And so what we're going to talk about is we're going to remind ourselves about the parallel transport of a vector from this point here to this point here. And that vector I'm going to draw at this point here, and I'm going to call it uh, the vector z. And z will have its components alpha. And just to make sure we understand that z is a vector that lives at that spot, I'm going to put in x mu here. Now that's a problem, right? That's a notation problem because z alpha of x mu absolutely looks like it's a vector field z. And uh, I don't want to talk about a vector field z. In this case, I want to just talk about a vector that lives right inside the vector space. You remember how every point in space-time has its own tangent vector space. I want to talk about a member of the tangent space that lives at the point P, right? And I only want to talk about one of them. Now, there is a tangent space that lives up here, right? There's a tangent space we'll call this point Q. There is a tangent space at Q. And I want to eventually talk about a vector that lives there. But this absolutely looks like a vector field. But for the purposes of this problem, I don't want you to think of it as a vector field. I just want you to think of it as the vector z located at the point x. I, I suppose I could do z alpha at p, right? That would be better. Um, the problem is, is I kind of want to exploit this argument notation in a later step of this, of this problem. All right, so with that in hand, I'm going to go back to this is the vector that's living right here. It's the vector at this point. So now we remember that we can parallel transport this vector from this point to this point. And that parallel transport is driven by the fact that this space-time has a connection. And we know it has a connection because we're going to assume it. We're, we're talking about space-time now. We are dealing with a space-time. Therefore, we know a bunch of things. We know that it has coordinates, right? Because we know that a space-time is, by definition, a four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold, right? And because it's a manifold, we know that it has coordinates. That's the whole point of a manifold, is that it has coordinates. We are now going to additionally say that there is some kind of metric on our manifold. And once we have a metric, we know we can get a connection because we understand how to create the metric connection. So all that is assumed here. All that is assumed. Now, the question is, how are we going to characterize the curvature of this thing, right? That's our plan for this lesson, is to understand the curvature that is driven by this metric flowing through the connection that it creates. 
we want to have a new way, a higher level way of characterizing the curvatures. This is a very low level way. This is an intermediate level way. We're looking for a higher level way. But all of this stuff here is assumed to exist. Okay, so with that in mind, um, back to the parallel transport. So I just erase everything except the connection because we know we have a connection. So because we are exercising parallel transport, we know that there is some vector here in this point that is the parallel propagation of this guy. And it's going to be parallel propagated along a line that connects the two spot points. And that's where the smallness comes, right? This line is this, is this little uh, supposed vector that would connect this point here to this point here that could only possibly make sense in a very, very small region of space-time. But we went through this construction in a previous lesson, and we understand that at this point, there's going to be some vector, which we're going to call z of alpha at x mu plus delta x mu. So I now have another vector, which is the parallel vector, um, of this guy here, which we started with, at this point here. And the coordinates of this point is given by that. And that's why I throwed it, threw it into this sort of argument labeling the, uh, the new vector. So these are two different vectors. And notice I still don't really have a true vector field. In principle, everywhere along this route, I could create a new parallel transported vector. But I am only going to talk about these two guys right here. All right, now with that in mind, we want to understand what are, this is the components. Z alpha is the components of the vector at this point. We know the components of the vector at this point because it was given. This is our given. But we don't know is the components of the vector at that point. Except that we do know the components of the vector at that point because we have a connection, which is the point of the connection is to define what parallelism means. And defining what parallelism means literally means telling us what the components at a nearby point in space-time are of a vector to be parallel transported. So um, cleaning this up a bit, uh, we, can, uh, we can show how that, rem remind you how that calculation actually works. All right, so first I'll move this down here just to remind us that that's the point. And I want to relabel this guy here as Z alpha of X mu plus delta x mu and if and now I want to place in this vector space here Seven. I want to place now this is another vector in this vector space but it has the exact same components as ZA right so this is sort of ZA with those components and that vector is totally unrelated right in some sense this vector here is just some vector that has the exact same components that I, uh, as the vector over here, but living in this vector space. And I only want to put it there for the illustration of the fact that the change in those two, this guy here, we, uh, we give that a name. We call that delta z bar. I think I'll call it delta z bar. Or, or wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, sorry. We called it delta bar z, right? because I'm putting a delta bar so I don't confuse it with a small change in coordinates. I want it to mean a change in the components of the vector z. And so I now write down that z alpha at the point x mu plus delta x mu is equal to the value, the, the, so the value of the components of the vector at this point equals the value of the components of the vector at the original point plus delta bar z alpha. And delta bar z alpha is calculated using this guy for infinitesimal uh, size uh, deltas, right? As long as delta z alpha is small, as long as delta x mu is small, I can always write that delta z alpha equals, and this is the expression, the change in the components of this vector when it's parallel transported to a nearby point through uh, delta x mu coordinate differences, 
that change, the change in that coordinate, those component values, is equal to opposite of the connection where this expression right here is the connection mo uh, uh, contracted into the original components of the vector at the original point and contracted into this little guy here, which is this change in coordinate values. This is our small number. Now notice how this gets really confusing to uh, students who are looking at this the first time. Right now, you know, x in principle could be uh, a vector field, right? We're not treating it as a vector field. We're just saying we need to know a vector at this point. Oops, why do I have x there? I shouldn't have x. That should be a z, right? That should be a z. Um, but uh, this is meant to, to talk to you, tell you that we're talking about the components at this point. In principle, it could be a vector field, and I could just be ignoring the rest of the field, though. I mean, this, is, this z could have an actual value at this point. And in fact, when we did our analysis of covariant derivative, it was critical that this is a vector field. You can't take the covariant derivative of a vector at a place. You need a covariant derivative of a vector field. But that's not how we're looking at it this time. This is just the vector um, at this point here. This, however, is a field, right? The, the connection is a field because the connection has a value at every point in space-time. So I'm interested in the value of the connection at this point in space-time as well. And then this, and this tells me everything about how it's going to change with a small increment in changing of the coordinates, right? And ultimately, it tells me what this guy is. And so now I can write down this expression uh, completely. And here it is. This guy here, the value of the components of the parallel transported vector z is equal to the original components of z at the original point, minus this expression, where this is the function of space-time for the connection that's presumed to be given. Um, I'm using kappa to sum over. How's my little kappa here is not quite as clear. This is a kappa. This is a kappa. And um, uh, this represents the value of the vector at the original point, and this is the small change in the coordinate values over here. And this expression uh, gives us this parallel transported vector. All right, so here's the cleaned up version of everything. Uh, I'm tempted to drop the subscript here and just write this as z alpha, z alpha like that. And we, if we ever see it without, without the, um, I don't mean subscript, I mean argument. If we ever see the vector components without the argument, you have to assume that it's the one we started with at p, right? I can't drop the argument here because this is a continuous function on space-time. And it's critical to know where we're taking the value at. The, this expression for these components, the components of this parallel transported vector at the point Q, right, that, this is the point Q here, the, um, uh, that is critically dependent on taking the value of the connection at the point P. And we're leaning on the fact that we've got a small increment in space-time here, or an increment that's going to go to zero, that this delta is, is small enough. But this is actually, you cannot really get rid of this argument, because you have to know you're taking the connection here at p. On the other hand, here I drop the argument, because I'm talking about the components of z at p, and it's just a little more convenient to drop the argument there. So maybe what I'll do is um, I will erase the argument here just for... Um, just to be consistent between both parts of this equation. So whenever you see the components of the vector z without any argument, it's because it's at p. At q, I got to make sure we understand we're dealing with q because we're about to move to another point, s. All right, that's what this whole game is about. We're going to move from q to s using a different um, uh, displacement in coordinates, which I'll call delta x, like that. And delta x, taking us from q to x, uh, that's going to be a second displacement. And to get that displacement, we're going to need the value of the connection coefficients at q, which are different than at p. So 
That's why we have to retain this argument with the connection coefficient here. I can kind of give it away here. I probably shouldn't because it's a little imbalanced. It, although I think it's okay. We want to lean on the fact this is our original vector, and that's special. It was given. So it is kind of unique, and it's okay to stand out. And the way it's standing out is by no longer having uh, this label on it. And so maybe I should just say that this point is labeled x mu. I don't know, probably need the label here just so we all know what's going on. Anyway, this is purely notational matters, but it, it it's one of the reasons the subject is confusing is you got to remember that this is a this is a field on space-time and therefore it's evaluated at different points. These are vector components given at a point, and this is displacement in coordinates alone, right? That's what these things are, and that's how this creature here is literally defined. It's defined through this equation. The components of a parallel transported vector is the original vector at the original point, and this guy tells us what that new component is. It breaks the seal between these two vector spaces, the tangent space that lives at P and the tangent space that lives at Q. Right? Remember, this was the tangent space at the point P um, for, uh, what is it, um, 1, 0, uh, the one zero tensor product space at P, and this is the one zero tensor product space at Q, and those are totally different tensor product spaces. They can't communicate. They're not related in any obvious way. The vectors in this space are not related to the vectors in this space. Oh, except we have a connection on this manifold, and these places Q and P are connected by coordinates. In that case, they are in fact related, and that relationship is what the connection is. So that's why the word connection, I don't know, the true history of the word connection, but it connects these vector spaces together. So to me, that's good enough. That's what it means in my mind. Okay, so now we're going to take the rest of this process goes to take this vector and parallel transport it to this new point S. And the ultimate goal here is we're going to do it in this order, P to Q, Q to S, and we're going to get some answer. And that answer means we're going to get the components of a vector inside the tangent space at S that represents the parallel transport of this vector along this little line that connects P and Q and then along the line that connects Q and S. And we're going to get some components. Then we're going to repeat this process going from, going from uh, X to some point out here, and then we'll call that R, I guess, and then from R to S. And we're going to get another answer. And you would think that those two answers might be the same. Of course, they're not. Now, in a flat space, it doesn't matter if you take a parallel vector, you, if you parallel transport a vector from here to here, and then from here to here, or from here to here and here to here, you always end up with the same answer. That's what flat space is like. But to the extent that the answer is different, that's an indi indication of curvature. And ultimately, the Riemann tensor tells us about that difference, right? So that's a little foreshadowing. But we're going to execute the full calculation now. And the next step in the process is not too difficult to see. We're now starting with this vector, and we're going to move it here. So we're moving the, the vector that was parallel transported from P to Q. We're going to take that vector and parallel transport it to S. So we're going to repeat this equation using this vector as the starting point. So this is the uh, general expression. Oops, I forgot a, uh, I guess a mu here, right? Uh, I've got a little mu there for what it's worth. Uh, remember, this is still the same thing. It's a displacement of coordinate values, just like this. It's just from Q to S. So the total displacement from this point to this point is actually X mu plus delta X mu plus capital delta X mu, right? That represents the true value of the coordinates at S. It's not an approximation either. I mean, these deltas can go to zero, but uh, as long as they're, you know, of any size at all, that is literally the coordinates of this point at S. And um, the problem with this kind of notation, and you can see I've sort of played with it right here by replacing the pluses with arrows, um, is because we want to do it in a certain order. And certainly the value of the coordinates at S doesn't matter if you add this first or that. But I want to also articulate that there's a path involved, right? A path from P to Q to S. So it has to go in this order. So I've got these little arrows in here. Of course, the point is, is that this is the components of a vector at a point S that has coordinates. So 
you have to sort of understand that you need to sort of add these up, but I also want to imply order. So maybe I could invent some notation, right? Why don't we just invent some notation, right? Uh, maybe if I, I, these arrows aren't good because they don't let me add. So maybe if I put little crosses on the arrows, it tells us you're adding, but you're, it's not very clean, is it? You're adding, but you're, um, you're adding it in along a certain pathway. Now, granted, remember, the number isn't going to change if you swap this with this. But the value of this, as I foreshadowed a moment ago, will in fact change if you do the sequence in the wrong order. So this is to try to capture the fact that we're dealing with the components of a vector z that's been parallel transported from p to q to s. That's captured by the arrows, 2q, 2s. And the value of the coordinate at s is the sum of those little deltas. So I've, I've created notation that will capture both of them. Uh, here it's a little silly because there's only one way to go, right? You know, I, I probably don't even, in this case, I probably should not uh, add my new notation. This stuff's been in the works for 100 years, and here I am on the fly creating new notation. That's probably not a good idea. Okay, anyway, um, proceeding... Uh, this is now the expression for the value of the components at this point S uh, in terms, essentially, of this point here, of, of the value of the components of the vector at Z. Right? That's the value of the components at the point Q. Um, this is the connection coefficient at the point Q. You can see, because I've kept that argument, you know it's at the point Q. And then this is the value of the uh, co uh, components of the vector z at q, and then this is the new displacement from q to s. So now I know what this is, right? I can substitute this here, right? I can substitute this material right there for this right here, and uh, likewise I can substitute this up here for this guy down here, so that's easy. Um, this one, however, uh, you can take it two ways. One you can say is, well, look, this is given. You just kept saying it was given, right? You said, I know this function for all points in space-time. So therefore, what the heck? Yeah, uh, it's true. However, we want, we want to know about the components of this vector. We want to know this actor, vector entirely in terms of everything local to P. So everything about this function that we can understand at P is all we want to understand what it is, what the components of the parallel transport along this, these two lines at S are. I don't want to rely on knowing something at Q or at S or anywhere in between. I want to stay entirely local to this. And my answer, the answer meaning the components of this parallel transport, doubly parallel transported vector at S, those components are the answer we're seeking, and I want that answer entirely in terms of things that are totally local to the original point P. What's local to the original point P? Well, the components are local to the original point P, and the value of the connection is totally local at this point P. But what's also local at this point P is the derivative of the connection, right? The first derivative of the connection. That's also local to point P. So I can use that. And indeed, that's exactly what I'm going to use. I'm going to use the value at the point P plus its derivative at the point P to get a good estimate at Q. And as long as delta is small, that estimate will be very, very good. And then now that I have the value of the connection at the point Q, I'll use that to estimate our final answer at the point S. So let's use things that are local to the point P to find the value of this guy right here. Not a hard expression, because we're just going to Taylor expand, right? We're going to say that the value of the connection coefficient at the point Q is the value of the connection coefficient at the point X, X or P, which is local to point P, right, the value of the coefficient at P, and then you take the first derivative of 
the connection coefficient at p and multiply by this increment, and that is the first ordered correction of the value of the connection at p. That's the first order correction that gives you the connection at q. And by the way, this is our first sort of place where we can say what small means, right? To the extent that this answer is correct, identifies if this is small, because these second order and third order terms have to be negligible. If the second and third order terms are negligible, based on whatever our criteria it is, then this is small. But we can now replace this expression with this expression, and now we have everything local at p. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take this and substitute it right there, right? Mm, let's see, I'm also going to make this substitution too. I'm going to make this substitution and the one we just talked about. Okay, so here's that substitution. This piece here has been substituted for this. Now you'll notice that I'm for when z is alone, I'm just presuming it is the value of z right here at p. And because it starts getting too long to write. So, I mean, notation actually has this practical consequence in these strange places, but uh, ne nevertheless, I've eliminated the... Uh, the x mu and the, as an argument here. So we know that this is all local to p for this z. Uh, however, I've retained it here because I could have made the same, actually, I could have made the same elimination. I should have said the coefficient, coefficient, the, the connection coefficients, if there's no argument, then assume it's at p. That would have made this a little cleaner, and I, I should have done that. But anyway, um, so it's the connection coefficient local to p times the uh, components local to p times this little displacement. That's this expression up here that we uh, already worked out. Then this expression here is the value of the connection coefficient at q using the linear uh, in, using the linear estimate. So this is our first sense of having a small displacement delta uh, x super delta. Um, and uh, then this is the same replacement we did here, right? This, this guy right up here being replaced into this here. That's what this guy is. And then here's your capital delta Q. Um, one other little artifact I guess I should point out is, is that when you have these arguments carried around, I love talking about notation. I don't, I don't know why, but when you carry these arguments around, you end up with these indices. And these, these are not vectors, right? These are this, the coordinate X, I'll just remind everybody, that's not a vector. Even though it has a superscript mu, it's not a vector. It's, you never see uh, the coordinates mu tied to a unit vector of any kind. That never happens. That is literally just a notational stand-in for either x1 or x0, x1, x2, or x3. Or sometimes it's a stand-in for the ordered quadruple. But as it is in the argument, it's important not to be confused that these indices in here, they do not have to be summed over. They don't follow the rules of indexed gymnastics. All the indices outside, though, do. So here you have the Einstein sum on B, and here you have the Einstein sum on gamma. Those do follow the Einstein summation convention. But uh, notice that... Um, this is not a tensor, but then again, this here is not a vector either. Um, this is the only vector, and this is the vector components. This is an equation for the vector components. All right, so um, now that we have that, we are going to expand this as far as we can. And what are we going to see? We're going to see this term and that term are going to come together. This term and this term are going to come together, and you're going to have a derivative of a connection coefficient multiplied by a connection coefficient. And then you're going to have a derivative of a connection coefficient multiplied by the vector itself. And one term is going to actually be of third order. The third term, this multiplied by this, because remember this is out here, that's going to be third order. And we're going to ignore that. We're only going to keep the second order terms. And when we do that, what do we get? Oops, I just noticed an error in my substitution, right? I I substituted literally this expression here, and that's a mistake because this is the vector that needs to be uh, summing over kappa. So these two, this alpha here and that alpha there, those need to be kappas, right? 
those need without being kappas, um, the uh, the indexes indices don't work work out. But you know what? That that's the beauty of this. Uh, immediately upon simplifying this, I noticed the mistake because it is absolutely a, a you you can't you can't make anything work logically unless it all ties together. The only leftover index in this vector here is uh, these two are summed over, so it's got to be this kappa. That kappa we know has to sum down here in order to keep this structure. See, the vector is summing over this first index on the connection coefficient. So this vector has to sum over the first index of this connection coefficient, which is going to be k. Okay, so I made that correction. And likewise, I just noticed that this delta here is also going to be, uh, should be a sigma, should be a sigma. That is, so what did I correct here, just to make sure, there's a delta, there, this guy right here, I had a moment ago as delta, and that's incorrect. It should be sigma, uh, should not even be sigma, uh, should be gamma, I, I just said sigma, but it should be gamma, because that is the structure that we built over here, right? The increment is summed over the derivative index, right? Because you're, that's, that, that's the derivative term, and you're going to be multiplying that by the little increment to get the first order correction for the connection. So that has to be a gamma. So I have the gamma here. And then there'll be one other term. There'll be this term multiplied by this term, which will be a minus sign times a minus sign, which will be a plus sign, multiplied by that term. But this last term is going to have delta x gamma, delta x gamma again, and then capital delta x sigma. And that's third order in something that's supposed to be small. And these things are small enough that we are ignoring the higher order terms here. So they should be small enough that we could ignore the third order term here relative to all these others that are second order. This one's second order, this one's second order. That's actually first order, and that's first order, and that's zeroth order. So we're going to ignore the third order term plus order three, and then we ignore that. And then this is what we have left. So this guy is our answer. And the answer is we are seeking the components of the parallel transported vector that goes this way those components and you know alpha can be 0 1 2 and 3 you do this equation for each alpha so there's four of these and um and that's right though everything else will sum over that'll sum that'll sum that'll sum that'll sum the kappas the betas the gammas will sum the sigma will sum uh, kappa sigma gamma, those will sum. You'll only have alpha. So you have four equations here. And those four equations will uh, tell you each of the four components of the vector that's been moved from P to S. So the next step should be relatively obvious. I've already foreshadowed it quite a bit. But the next step is to repeat this process, but go from X to some point out here called R and then to S. And it's just the inversion of the sequence which you add these incremental changes in coordinates. So I guess you would have the uh, vera arrow here going to delta x, capital delta x mu, and then little delta, or lowercase delta x mu. And when you do that, you'll get a similar expression, but it will be different. It will be different. Let's uh, write down the new expression uh, going the other way. I guess the first thing I'll do is I will take... I'll clean this up a bit, and then we'll write down the new expression. Okay, let's see if this cleaning up helped. I kind of hid our expression, our, our QS expression, right down here. And now we're going to do the expression for RS. Notice it's, you, you land in the exact same spot. Sometimes there's a little confusion about this point. But you're literally adding coordinate values. So you, you land at some point R. That's the only new thing. But once you add this to R, you're going to get back to S exactly. So it's not like the loop um, doesn't close. The loop actually closes. Um, it's just what happens to this parallel transported vector at this point along these two paths. That's what's different. So this is going to parallel transport. And you notice how I'm drawing these wacky vectors. 
you know, there's there's no obvious relationship between this guy and that guy. And that's I'm just trying to emphasize that that's fine. That actually could be that way. It could very well be that the components of this vector here, parallel transported by this line, is some weird, unfathomably complicated relationship to those. It's all dependent on the connection. So just because these are not even attempting for me to be parallel, I'm asserting that they are the parallel transports of one another. Now, it is typical in a lot of books to emphasize the fact that this one is the parallel transport of this one by actually drawing it in a way that appears parallel, right? That actually kind of looks parallel. The problem with doing that is uh, you're leaning, of course, on the notion of parallelism in Euclidean space, and it kind of doesn't really help you understand the fact that um, parallelism is an arbitrary concept in this kind of geometry. It all depends on this guy. And so I'd rather just stipulate, I want to say these two are parallel transports of each other. That's why I repeat it over and over again, is to remind you, because there's no visual cue in the method that I'm using. That's the weakness of the method. The strength of the method is to, that it literally reminds you, I, I guess in a way, you're, it takes you, um, it, it denies you the opportunity to lean on your Cartesian, Euclidean notion of parallelism, right? Like this vector here, if I were to use the sort of the more standard treatment might actually look something like, well, it can't be curved, right? It's got to be a straight line. So it would be like that because it would be parallel to that. So that kind of indicates that it's parallel. But these blue vectors are all parallel to each other, or they're all parallel transports of this vector here. I know I've said that a million times. Okay, so now we want to do this calculation in the reverse order. So we what we want to do is we want to calculate... Um, let's see if I can make a little room. Uh, we want to calculate Z alpha of X mu line capital X mu line little x mu. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to break out into a new screen and do that calculation. Um, before I begin this, yes, it is as simple as you might think it would be. If we literally take this and replace every lowercase del x with an uppercase del x, that is the exact equivalent of going the other way around, right? There's no real reason. And by the way, I, I guess I've emphasized, I dropped the argument away from these uh, uh, connection coefficients because now everything is local. Everything is understood to be evaluated at the point P. So everything is local. So I don't, once I say that everything, once we get to a point where everything is local, we can drop the argument. Okay, so I, I'm going to really write, rewrite this expression just with the deltas swapped. And there you have it. Uh, I noticed that up here I put z with a lowercase b, and that's supposed to sum over that beta, so that lowercase b should be a beta. I guess I just confused my b's and betas when I wrote that out. But anyway, uh, uh, I did not do that here. I left it with a beta there, so beta, beta. It's all the same thing. It's just I switched... The lowercase del with the capital delta for these co coordinate increments. And everything is local, so there's no more references, there's no more messy references to the actual um, uh, points in space time, or no more references directly to P. Everything is assumed to be at this first point we started at. And so now we have an expression of the components using one route and the components using another route. And notice that there's really no reason to think that this and this are going to be the same, right? When I change, I mean, little delta and capital delta, these are arbitrary. So this term here is completely different than this term here, right? With the little delta, once I replace it with the capital delta, it's a totally different value. And the same is true with, um, uh, with this term here, right? That's a totally different value also. So... Um, Actually, I need to be careful when I say that. Yes, it's true. This term will be a totally different value when I switch little delta, little uh, lowercase uh, delta x with capital delta x. But notice the term right next to it is exactly the same structure. So switching, and then we and we switch capital delta with lowercase delta. So what happens is yes, this term is different, and yes, this term has a value that's different. <clears throat> 
it turns out that you're just swapping these two terms, right? So, so th this does not really change between these two expressions. In other words, uh, the, the zero order term is obviously the same for both paths, whether you go, with, I'm sorry, whether you, this path here, whether you go from x mu, whether you go from p to s to q, the first term doesn't change if you go from q to s. Q to R to S. So the first term is the same. The second term changes, and the third term changes, but they change into each other. So the first three terms of these two completely uh, are the same. The problem is when you do when you look at these two terms. Here the issue is the uh, the summation sequence is getting a bit mixed up because you're summing the large one into gamma, and you're summing uh, capital delta x gamma into this second gamma term with the index on the right side. And in that case, you're summing it uh, with the index, you're summing this the small, uh, the lowercase delta term with the index on the right side. So this summation actually will change because you're kind of mixing up the way these things are added up together. And this one definitely will change because here you're summing the capital delta into the derivative part of the uh, derivative of the connection coefficient, and you're summing the lowercase delta into the body of it, and here you're doing just the opposite. So those two terms will change. In other words, the difference between these two will not be zero, but the, the difference between them is all in the second order terms. The first order terms simply cancel. So the difference is kind of what we're after. So how do we calculate the difference? And this, I believe, is my final result. I've taken this and subtracted from it this. The first three terms cancel, leaving this and this minus this and this. And then you relabel everything so that the so that you can factor. You gotta factor it out. So all the z's have to have the same label. So you have to relabel everything to get the z's right. So I have to relabel, I guess, this z beta to a kappa so I can pull that out. You have to label all of these. Uh, gammas, those are already, the way I've done it, they are already the same. And you have to make sure everything has the same labels so you can pull them out. For some reason, I changed it to eta when I did my notes. And you end up with this expression. And of course, this expression is exactly the expression for the Riemann tensor, right? This is the expression you should, you should remember from uh, our, last, uh, our last lesson. Our alpha, kappa, eta, sigma would be kappa eta sigma in this case. And that's what this guy is. And so z k delta x sigma capital delta x eta. And so this expression is what the curvature tensor is trying to tell us. It's telling us the difference, the difference between the components of a vector parallel translated in one direction around this little rectangle minus the components of a parallel transport in the other direction around the same rectangle. The fact that these two components are not equal is an exact expression of the fact that the Riemann tensor is not zero. If the Riemann tensor was zero, then this difference would be zero, and the components of parallel transport in either of these directions would be exactly the same. But as it is, when you get to this point here, when you get to that point here, you have two different vectors. You have two different vectors, and uh, I guess I'll draw them in. One will come around and be this guy, and the other, let's, we'll call that one uh, the PQS vector, and then one will come around and it'll be this guy, and we'll call that the PRS vector. And these two vectors won't be the same. And this difference, this difference here, I guess, whoops, the way I did it was PQS minus PRS. So PQS plus the difference will equal PRS. So that difference there is going to be um, equal to the Riemann tensor, right? We go down here, look at the formula. The Riemann tensor is, it's a, it's a tensor. So the Riemann tensor, and then you have three arguments in here. Now, uh, that, this calculation, this 
so this is actually an, uh, an important and subtle point. This calculation involves two coordinate differences, two coordinate differences and uh, the initial vector. And what's left over in principle should be a vector with the weird caveat that these guys aren't vectors. So it's like, wait a minute, how this is a tensor. A tensor takes three vector arguments. These are displacements in coordinates. These are coordinate displacements. So what gives there? So now we have to sort of presume that they're vectors all of a sudden. That's an important point we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, let's first get past what this thing is. This thing will give you the components of this vector here, the difference between the uh, parallel transport around this loop. And it's entirely in terms of things that you know from P. So from information you glean at P, which is the vector itself, the little displacements that you're going to be exercising, um, the connection coefficients and the first de derivative of those coefficients, that tells you how much you're going to be off by going through one path versus another path. Now, the reason that this ultimately becomes the Riemann tensor, and that's why I don't like this exposition, is because what we're doing is I'm calling this guy a tensor, but I'm actually operating on it on two things that are not really vectors. They're coordinate differences, right? What we really want is something that looks like a tensor, and the way I've drawn it here, it takes a, um, a covector, and then it takes three vectors, right? So what we're doing essentially is because we're playing around with this notion of small displacements on a space-time, what we're doing is we're actually cheating a little bit. What we're saying is this displacement here, this displacement here, you know what it really is? We're going to go into this vector space and we're going to actually create a tiny vector and that vector is going to represent the coordinate differences. The components of that tiny vector are going to be delta x mu, and it actually is going to be a vector. And what we're going to say is that we're in, we're, this spot is so small, that this difference is so small, that we can pretend space-time is flat, and we can actually pretend that q and p are related by a displacement vector a little itty-bitty displacement vector. We're going to cheat, right? And we're going to say that Q is actually displaced from, from P by a vector, and that vector is going to be this guy. And when we do that, because this guy, the components are small, and small now means that space-time is relatively flat around here. It's as close to flat as we might want to make it, um, which means that ultimately this will be small, right? Because that's the definition of flat space-time is this is small. But it's not going to be zero. It's not going away. So now we can interpret this as a tensor. Now you can check that this object is a tensor. We do know it because we did our work in the formal uh, section in the last lecture. So we know this is a tensor, which, we mean, we mean, which means we know it's linear. We know if we do coordinate transformations on it, we're going to get the exact same thing back in prime coordinates. But now what we do is we say that this re, this are, these are the components. This guy is a tensor. These are the components of a tensor. And these small displacements are going to be treated as uh, little vectors of displacement. And that is the Riemann tensor in coordinates. Uh, in the coordinate basis using just entirely a coordinate type basis analysis. And this is by far the most common analysis done in, uh, in, in elementary general relativity textbooks. And so the other thing to say is this thing should be zero in flat space-time, right? In, in flat space-time, when you, when you parallel transport this way or this way, you end up with the exact same vector. This green vector and this blue vector are right on top of each other. R, the red vector, is zero. And that is how you tell you have a flat space-time, is if the Riemann uh, curvature tensor disappears. Notice that you can't tell directly from the coefficient, right? There's no um, immediate way of looking at the connection coefficients and determining if you have flat space-time. I could have flat space-time in spherical coordinates, and these coefficients are certainly not zero, right? So... But it's still flat. But the Riemann tensor will be flat when you combine this, when you take these connection coefficients and run it through this expression here, every single term will be zero. Uh, 
every single term will be zero. That is not an obvious relationship, right? But that's what this curvature tensor is telling us using this first intuitive picture of how it works. All right, so now the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll take this analysis and we'll kind of tie it together with the formal analysis. And we'll see how the formal analysis is actually telling you the same thing about moving around a loop, right? Now we're going to, now that we've gone through this exercise, we're going to use the formal analysis and study how that tells us this, that actually has the same information in it and can be interpreted in exactly this way. And then we'll talk about a different view of the Riemann tensor that is often uh, expressed in elementary textbooks called geodesic deviation. And that actually has physical consequences. So that one's very interesting. Okay, see you next time.